Hello, everybody. My name is Wynn Harden. Thanks for joining us on Manufacturing Matters, where we talk about the technologies and trends that are reshaping the global manufacturing environment. I'm here at, in Chicago at IMTS International, and I'm lucky enough to be joined by Brian Sherrick, who is Global President of Flow International, and also Nino Laduca, who is CEO and President of Shape Technologies Group. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Yep. Good to be here. I appreciate you taking some time out of the busy show floor today. For sure. Beautiful. So um, before we get into it, tell us a little bit about, we're mainly going to talk about Flow International today. Brian, can you kick us off and tell us a little bit about your product lines and where you fit in the market? Absolutely. Yeah, happy to. So uh, Flow International is a American-based manufacturer of water jet technology. We're mm -hmm. headquartered out of Kent, Washington, just outside of Seattle. Right. And we're celebrating 50 years, our anniversary this year, and we make a diverse range of different water jet technology and products and right. shape cutting systems. Beautiful. Yeah. How's the weather been up in Seattle lately? Are you guys near any of the fires or anything interesting <laughs> no, up that way? It's been a great summer. Yeah. Beautiful. No, summer in Seattle is the place you want to be. Yeah, absolutely. The rest of the year, you know, questionable. Yeah. For the, the three weeks, it's just absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> and very little rain. Right? Very little rain. Very, very little rain. rain. Yeah, summer's a, yeah. great. Beautiful, yeah. wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Um, Nino, do you want to tell us a little bit just about what your position is in, in the larger scope of things? Absolutely, I'd love to. Uh, so I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Shape Technologies Group. Mm -hmm. uh, so Shape is a management company that invests in what we'll call unique premium brand technology companies. Okay. Uh, Shape Process Automation, headquartered in Auburn Hills, Michigan, is our flagship robotics and automation group. Mm -hmm. We have a group called Shape Water Blast Group, which does a lot of industrial and surface preparation cleaning. Okay. And then we own some of the uh, most unique global recognized brands when it comes to ultra high pressure water jet technology. Uh, H2O Jet, KMT or two, but the, the flagship is the Flow International uh, company, which is a global company yes. um, that has uh, headquarters in Kent, Washington, like uh, Brian explained, but mm -hmm. also we have presence in uh, Europe and uh, Asia Pacific as well. That's a beautiful booth up there when yeah, I saw it earlier. Yeah. Fantastic demos up there, and you guys have uh, put a lot of effort and resources into that. So, thank you. Um, has, the, has the flow been pretty good? Not, yeah. Oh, sorry. Good. I uh, like the I like the wording there. <laughs> yeah. No, it's been flowing well. Yeah. Uh, we got four live machines there in the booth, yeah. and uh, been traffic's been really good the first couple of days. So Fantastic. we're having a good show. Fantastic. Yep. So I understand that Flow International is celebrating 50 years of water jet success this year. Indeed. You want to tell us a little bit about how you guys are celebrating? And Absolutely. Yeah, we're, we're a very proud water jet company with uh, some of the original invention came from Flow with the abrasive water jet technology. Okay. Matter of fact, Dr. Mohammed Hashish is in our booth today speaking. He's one of the original uh, inventors of the process. But yeah, it's a great company, great culture. Um, people are are very committed to the success of the organization with right. great tenure. We have some people that have been there over 40 years. Right. Um, average tenure is 15 years at the company. And yeah, we're super proud of, of our 50 years of history and looking forward to 50 more. Well, that's beautiful. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so tell us a little bit, if you would, what, what's some of the new stuff that's up there? What are we talking about this week? Yeah, the four different platforms we have in the booth, we, we call it our mock series of machines mm -hmm. that we have there. And we have our new Mach 150 on display, okay. um, which is a great uh, kind of R&D, small envelope, you know, our economy line of, of equipment, okay. all the way up to our Mach 500, which is on display. So right. the large, more production style machinery. Mm -hmm. We also have an Echo Jet there, mm -hmm. which is a fully enclosed water jet, which has become very popular. A lot of the CNC shops um, really want quiet, enclosed, clean equipment. Right. Um, so the Echo Jet's uh, a, a great machine as well for us. Fantastic. So, so the, the new 150, mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of an entry level uh, element in there as well as you said R&D, right? So is it throughput and, and uh, is that a big part of that? It is. It really is like a lot of tool, tool rooms or R&D shops or universities, education facilities, mm -hmm. they'll use the Mach 150. You know, it's, it's economically priced. So you can get the technology uh, affordably, right? And then you know, kind of scalable from there. Oh, I came up with another pun. So you can get your toes wet. Get There's your toes wet. <laughs> exactly. I, 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 I bet you that's not the first time you've heard that one. No, right? no, it isn't. No, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if you could kick us off a little bit and tell us a little bit about water jet technology in general. Uh, when, what are the best applications for it? When are the best uses for it? I know it's a powerful system yeah, that's a great can reshape it all is. types of yeah. materials. I mean, the, the, the main advantage of a water jet is mm -hmm. its versatility. I mean, I, and I mean this literally, it'll cut any material type. Right. So, and that's almost hard to kind of wrap your head around at first, but literally we can erode any material. Okay. Um, so Even whether like it, titanium, the hardest. Titanium, there's a lot of applications in aerospace for titanium is right. a good example. Right. Uh, Inconel, ceramics, 
but even soft goods. There's a lot of plastic and insulation and food products. Mm -hmm. So the application is so broad and diverse mm -hmm. within WaterJet, okay. which is fantastic as a manufacturer because there's always some industries that are in demand, that, right. have, a, that have a need for the, for the equipment. And the water jet, I'm assuming when we're talking about food applications, we're probably not a lot of additives to the water stream, right? We're Correct. just using the pure force of it to, that, to exactly cut right. meat and process, yeah. process exactly raw, right. raw yeah. materials. A lot, of, a lot of chicken products, uh -huh. uh, a lot of cakes, a lot of vegetables. Uh -huh. um, obviously, the pure water jet, you know, we don't, we don't put the garnet sand in there. That wouldn't be good for the food products. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how garnet tastes. But I'm, I'm <laughs> not guess good. Not good. It, it looks like paprika, but I don't think it's the same. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, you mentioned Dr. Mohammed Hashish. Dr. Hashish, yep. and he's going to be giving a presentation along with another engineer of yours, right? Can yeah, you... we have several presentations that are going on in the booth talking about the different factors to evaluate when you're looking at water jet equipment, whether it's okay. pressure, um, kind of some of the history of water jet, uh -huh. different applications. So we have a number of different speakers um, throughout the week that are talking in the booth there. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and you, have a, you have another presentation that's a little bit forward looking, talking about future applications or? Certainly, yeah, we kind of, you know, always look into the future. You right. know, we're proud of what we've done, but it's all about what can we do next? Right. Um, whether it's, you know, higher pressure achievement to cut faster, um, more economically, less garnet abrasives. So we're always trying to make the process more reliable, faster, and less expensive for our customers. Okay. And we talked that the Mach 150 is a good entry level point for folks who are exploring this technology perhaps for mm -hmm. the first time, right? That's exactly but right. is there a set of general considerations that I got a feeling is probably mm -hmm. covered in that presentation upstairs? That if, if new customers are coming to you, they're looking at evaluating this, this um, material uh, cutting technology, mm -hmm. are there certain criteria they should consider, uh, you know, floor plant, power, throughput, where's the sweet spot? Or? Uh, for sure, and as I talked about earlier, you know, there's such a diverse range of applications, so right. it's kind of specific and unique to each individual customer's sure. needs, Sure. but at, at its core, you get, you got to buy a machine that is the right size, first and foremost. You've know, you got to be able to cut the product sizes that you need. And then a lot of it comes back to the pump technology that we build. Uh -huh. um, the pressure that we create is what really does the cutting. So the highest pressure possible pump technology will cut the fastest you know, possible product. Of course. So it's, it's size and pressure. Those okay. are key factors. Yeah. And can, we're talking can I add one thing? Well, yeah, pressure is so please. important. Yeah. Um, if you look at the, the brands that we have within Shape Technologies, two of the water jet brands that we have mm -hmm. have always been first to market with pressure milestones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Whether it was the 60K, the 90K technology, and soon we'll hopefully launch uh, some higher pressure, which Brian just indicated. Um, Flow has always been one of the two companies that have led the market to those milestone achievements. Okay. And then the other feather in the cap we always give ourselves is uh, Flow, in our opinion, inventive abrasive water jet cutting. Uh, another portfolio company of ours invented pure water jet cutting. Mm -hmm. Flow was the one that invented, through Dr. Muhammad Hashish, invented uh, cutting with abrasive. Gotcha. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when you said earlier that size is important, we're talking about the work envelope, right? Mm -hmm. right. right, exactly. So yeah. basically to be able to accommodate the part and any kind of movements of the part that needs to be right. happening. Yeah, the, the, you know, the sheet size of, you know, whether it's metal or plastic or stone or whatever it is, yeah. you know, 5 by 10 is a very common size, for example, 5 feet by 10 feet or uh -huh. um, even up to, you know, we do it in metric as well, 4 meters by 2 meters. Yeah. You know, those are most common size platforms. Are these units, are, do you have like fully automated systems where you're putting in material handling in there? Uh, Absolutely. Other than yeah. just say yeah. batch, and this yeah. is where the Absolutely. shape process automation division comes in to complement what we're doing at Flow. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. So, um, uh, so if you're if you're thinking about building a system, I mean, we've got work envelope, we've got speed and throughput, and as well as the material considerations, mm -hmm. and you know, um, you know, sanitary cutting, pure pure water, or if you're going to use an abrasive addition, um, how much do you need to think about say? Oh, I don't know if it's going to be an ERP integration system or if conveyance or others. Is that is that something that you, you, would you give advice? You know, uh, you, you might get into your first experiences using the Mach 150, but as you go up to higher product flows, you really need to be taking this into account. I mean, are there, is there any other guidance you can give folks? Well, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can tell you that software is a really a key element yeah. to this. You know, okay. the, the good software that models the process of the cutting, you know, the jet itself, right. is critically important to a quality part that we produce. Um, you don't want to have to have an operator that has years of experience that knows exactly which feed rate to cut every material, different geometries. Your software needs to be able to do that for you. Absolutely. So that's a critical piece of cutting good parts with a water jet. 
I would assume that's also a key component as we have labor shortages across sure. every every part of manufacturing right now, right? For sure. Um, and and um, are there any particular vertical industries that are that are clamoring the most, or maybe have, for example, we saw a lot of food packaging uh, ad adopt automation during during the pandemic time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, have, have you had any other surprises like that? Or are they are they going all in? Have they always been an active uh, customer in terms of say food processing? Food processing has historically been a really strong part of our industry okay. that we serve, yes. So right. whether it's food cutting or packaging or food equipment manufacturers, mm -hmm. all three of those uh, pieces of the food industry mm -hmm. are really big customer bases for our technology. Okay. Yeah. Is there a lot of robot integration when we're talking about water jet? There certainly is. Yeah, pick and place yeah. robots, bringing, bringing materials on and off machines, right. loading raw material on and off of water jets. Yeah. Um, we've created a lot of cells uh, where you, you work throughout a, a kind of a cellular format mm -hmm. where the robots are, are loading and unloading materials. You know, we used to call that flexible manufacturing, but I've been hearing the term fluid manufacturing more in this case these days. Yeah, interesting. Where the work cells are not even stationary, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the work cells themselves can be reconfigured yeah. For, yeah. for high customi customization, high variability products, or probably, and you mentioned aerospace, I think, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, that seems to be an area that's been, like, where you want to have the human, the assembler, perhaps in one single location. But, I mean, the number of assembly steps that they're going through is, you know, hundreds of thousands of different steps, all requiring different materials coming For sure. In. So, yeah, I mean, lean manufacturing in aerospace is, you know, is a big concept. And yeah. having that cellular format where one operator can move throughout multiple machine processes mm -hmm. and operate multiple, you know, steps in the process right. is really important. So, yeah. yeah. The way they configure the equipment kind of in a in a circular format and they can just move uh, amongst those different machines. Right, right. The next step might be to use some of the AMRs to start bringing those and, and the human doesn't even have to move at all, right? That's Which exactly right. Mm -hmm. Key component of yeah. just in time. Yeah. Well, I know that the conversation is about Flow International, but uh, our other division, Shape Process Automation, does cut almost identical materials as Flow does, but we have a water jet cutting head on the end of a robot. So okay. it gives the customer a little bit more flexibility if they're looking for a 3D cutting versus 2D XY cutting. Now, how would you compare the complexity of doing that versus, say, a laser cutting system or, or standard plasma? That's another great question, right? That's, yeah. yeah, I mean, the, you know, the laser and plasma and water jet are really complementary processes. Okay. They each kind of have their specialty or their niche in the market. Yeah. Um, water jet's unique because it's a cold cutting process, though. Okay. So okay. Those are both thermal processes that are going to melt materials. So they have right. material limitations. Absolutely. Uh, not all materials can be cut in that manner. And so, the, again, like I said at the beginning, the versatility of what we do is really our specialty. Right. Where, where they're a little more specialized in specific areas. Sure. With a narrower bandwidth of what, they, what they're capable of. And some materials just don't respond well to intense heat. Or, exactly I, or you right. have ablation yeah. in the case of lasers, which is maybe not going to give as clean a well. That's correct. exactly right. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, cut in this particular case. Yeah, yeah but, but even post-processing of cutting, whether it's finished machining, whether it's welding, whether it's bending, yeah. you know, that heat-affected zone right. can be a real problem, mm -hmm. especially in aerospace. You know, yeah. Aerospace does not like heat-affected zones on their materials. Yeah. No. It has to be removed. No, it needs to be consistent yeah. across. Do you ever have to do any kind of conformal coatings or anything else to protect a, you know, certain materials from the water, like a pre-processing step before? Not, not typically. That's okay. pretty rare, honestly. Right. Um, I mean, we're just using fresh, clean inlet water that we filter a little bit for right. particulates, but we're not putting any additives or any, um, any extra fluids or you know, hydraulics or anything like that into right. it. Um, and then we're using garnet sand. So we don't typically pre-treat any materials that we're cutting. Is the garnet sand completely an inert material, basically chemically not active? It, it is, yeah. yeah it's yeah. just a, a natural element, you know, garnet, garnet abrasive. Beautiful. Mined out of the ground. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're here pretty much smack in the middle of <laughs> IMTS right mm -hmm. now. Have you gentlemen had any opportunity to get outside of the booth and away from the army of folks who are <laughs> walking through? We, we have. Yeah. We walked around. I mean, <laughs> so first of all, we have a lot of great suppliers or partners, as we like to refer to them as. Right. Uh, within the company. So we always like to spend time with them and visit them. Uh, Fanic Robotics is one, certainly. So there's, there's several of them and it, it, it allows... They have a small booth. I think I saw it. it was no. In the back of the <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> they have a big booth. But um, no, it allows us to not only, um, you know, host customers that come to the flow booth and, and see what our customers are up to, but it really gives us an opportunity to go visit our partners and, and thank them for the partnership and, and see what they're up to as well. Right. So. 
So you, um, are, are your presenters just in booth, or are they, are they giving any technical presentations? We, we did both. Forth? Yeah, okay. yesterday uh, we actually gave a technical presentation about 3D water jet cutting. Um, had a pretty good audience there. I think there was 50 people that attended that. One of our, one of our associates gave the presentation. It went well. Beautiful. And then every day there's multiple presentations in the booth as well. Is 3D water cut jetting a relatively new thing? And forgive my ignorance in this case, but no, I've always just figured it's best to ask questions when you don't know the answer and don't try to act like an expert. <laughs> so. No, I appreciate that. No, yeah. I mean, typically we cut flat plate. That's the most right. common application. Mm -hmm. But in fact, we've been cutting three-dimensionally for the whole history of the company. Okay. So it's been around a long time. Right. It's just there's more applications for flat plate applications. Sure. But yeah, three-dimensional cutting has been around and very popular. It almost seems like it's the, the, the complement to an additive manufacturing. It can be, yeah. I mean, um, you know, additive is kind of the hot new trend, or know, it's not necessarily new, but uh, yeah. it's certainly Becoming a growing more, business. Right, yeah. larger envelopes and mm -hmm. a little bit better throughputs. Um, yep. um, still, I think, primarily on prototyping, except perhaps in aerospace with a laser centering type mm -hmm. stuff. I think automotive is using a lot of additive as well these mm -hmm. days, huh? Agreed, agreed. Um, so. Where I was going with the question about whether you got out a little bit yeah. was, what have you seen at IMTS that was, that was impressive, that, that stuck with you? Go ahead, Brian. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, my favorite part of IMTS is the networking. Like yeah, Nino yeah. said, dealing with all of our partners and getting to see all the people. I've been coming here for 25 years. So I've, it just seems like there's so many faces that I run into yeah. every two years here at IMTS. I love that part of the show. Yeah. Um, and then obviously it's a great selling event for our mm -hmm. business yeah. um, yes. and getting to inter interact with all of our customers again. But um, you know, IMTS is just a flagship show that we go to every two years and, and really enjoy it. How about you, Nino? Yeah, I mean, it, look, it's a big show. All four halls are, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, completely full. And it's, it's yeah. neat to see. Right, because there's so many people coming to the show, whether they're just in North America based or from Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, but to Brian's point, the networking is important. Getting around and seeing some of the new technologies and just seeing what everybody is doing out there is, uh, it means a lot to be here all week, so. Yeah, and it's interesting because it, even though this is one of the biggest shows I've ever been to, mm -hmm. um, other than some fairs in Germany and things of that nature, you don't, and it's spread out, but there are no gaps, and there's so many different events going on just you know, at 5 o'clock right after the show floor closes. Mm -hmm. uh, you got keynotes in the primary hallway. So it just seems like it's well-connected, yeah. you know? Completely so, agree. And, yeah. and, and, and it, I'm not sure. Um, I, it was, since it goes five days, you actually have the opportunity to see everything, which <laughs> you, do. you pretty much will need most of that time. You need the you whole do. time. Yeah, yeah, if you're yeah. a customer segment, you're going through. But at least they're starting to organize it really well yeah. into, into like the, the robotics automation component, I think, was relatively new this year, yeah. putting them in a central location. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, You definitely need to do a little planning when you come to the show. It can absolutely. be a little overwhelming yeah. if you just kind of show up yeah. and expect <laughs> to figure it out. So a little pre-planning is probably wise. I, I, <laughs> yes, I completely yeah. agree. It, yeah. It'll also save you a pair of shoes. So, <laughs> True. Um, uh, uh, so are there any particular, uh, you mentioned partnered FANUC, are there any particular technologies, um, and we talked about the people and the networking, mm -hmm. but are there any particular technologies that you see, you've seen out there this week? I think it's robotics and automation. I think right. that's that's the the big movement in manufacturing right yeah. now in general. Yeah. You know, being able to automate and and use robotics when possible mm -hmm. is so much more efficient way to do things in a factory or in a, in a shop. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the next you know big movement in the, in the business. Yeah. Actually, I like the word you said earlier when, which was fluid, not flexible, but fluid. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that, but. It's interesting you say that because I see that now. Mm -hmm. um, and to Brian's point, robotics and automation has always given customers flexibility. Mm -hmm. uh, but now with all the latest technologies around AMR and additional AR, AI, I yeah. think it is becoming more fluid rather than flexible. So that's, that's good to hear. Yeah, um, it, it, we're starting to see, in the last year, you know, seen robots that are starting to program themselves based yep. on large language models and actual verbal descriptions, not yep. just pull it, point, program, point, point, you know, mm -hmm. program yourself, which was already awesome, just gesture-based or, mm -hmm. or, or physical movement, taking the engineer out of the loop for retasking. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the cobots in particular, and even the industrial sure. bots. But we're also putting those arms on the AMRs now, mm -hmm. you know, for mm -hmm. the first time. It's been something we've been talking about for Correct. 10 years. Yeah. But uh, from what I'm hearing, you know, from talking with ABI Research and other folks yesterday, that... Um, that, that's a, a true missing link, and it's probably going to be mainly in greenfield installations, mm -hmm. right, versus the 80% that are primary brownfield, uh, just because it's such a unique, that fluid manufacturing is mm -hmm. such a unique environment. 
Um, but it's the kind of one of the last steps on the way to a lights out manufacturing environment Correct. in yeah. certain ways. I think another element of that is connected machinery. You yeah. know, really, really using, we have a technology called WaterJet Connect where it's the IoT capabilities, Internet mm -hmm. of Things, where we can connect to machines from any remote location. Right. Shop managers and owners can see how their machines are per performing. Right. We as an OEM can also do the same and help them be predictive in their maintenance. Yeah and not just preventative, but actually predict when maintenance intervals uh, need to occur. Mm -hmm. So do you see, you know, we've always had that um, SPC, statistical process control element machine vision. Uh, we've got CMMS systems out there for doing predictive maintenance, but the, you know, it seems like the capability has been there, but so many of our customers don't really leverage that data. I would agree, I would agree. Yeah. So, <laughs> I think they're starting to know. Yeah. Okay. I think with uh, maintenance groups, uh, shrinking, becoming smaller. Yeah. Um, certainly, when it's um, you know smaller uh, customers with limited resources, I think they are relying now on the OEM mm -hmm. to sort of tell them when when maintenance or intervals should happen, when spend in terms of spare parts and service should happen. So, mm -hmm. uh, I think the customers have become much uh, better educated, right. and and the quality of the product has improved over the years. So, I think it's just the right time now. That's, that's interesting that they're, they're, well, it's great for you guys, right? Because you're the experts on the machinery. So if there's going to be any kind of a recommendation mm -hmm. related to, you know, preventive maintenance to avoid unplanned downtime, mm -hmm. you guys are going to be the experts in, this, in the space. Um, is the cloud kind of being a key component for you guys in implementing that? Certainly. Okay. Yeah. 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 Our, our IoT capability, as I talked yeah. about a second ago, is all cloud-based uh, technology. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and. We're building sensoring into the actual hardware now where we can really see what's what's upcoming in yeah. its maintenance intervals and, and get in front of it. To me, it is it is awesome, essentially, that, that manufacturers have finally gotten past that fear of letting the data go beyond their walls, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because this is really, this connected, you know, this connectivity and convergence and everything in technologies, I think, is what's going to help us. It's going to greatly accelerate. Uh, I think we can agree the technology, automation technology de development and deployment in so many different industries and applications, sure. including in material removal and handling. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, we agree with that. Yep. Absolutely agree with that. Wonderful. So, um, gentlemen, we've had a, a great talk here. We talked a little bit about what's going up just around the corner up mm -hmm. at, the, at, the, at the booth. And I hope everyone who, is, uh, who has seen this, I, I'm sure you'll be able to find those presentations online after the fact, Correct. in Definitely. case you weren't able to come to Chicago this week. Um, are, are there any kind of closing thoughts, Nino, or that you want to share with us in the no, audience? I certainly appreciate the opportunity to do this, Win, and, and thank you. And um, again, we're we're always trying to look for new technologies out there. We're always looking for whether it's new partners, um, certainly new customers as well. And really appreciate everybody stopping by the Flow booth and giving us an opportunity to showcase the Flow product line. So, thanks, Win. Great. Absolutely. And about, Same. And I'm, you know, we're. A Flow's a proud manufacturer of water jet technology. Yeah. Anybody out there that has questions or is curious or wants to do any research at all, reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to engage with anybody around the world. Like Nino said, we have global locations. So, uh, you know, let us know what we can do for you. Great. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, you know, Brian, I really appreciate Absolutely. you taking some time out of your day to come Thank with you. us. Our pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you have any questions for Flow International or any of the Shape Technology Group companies, please just reach out to us at manufacturing-matters.com. You can find all of our previous episodes on whatever your favorite podcast platform or application. Uh, until that time, uh, just remember that manufacturing continues to matter in this world, and we look forward to seeing you next time.